This is Grace Notes. I'm Alan Button, and our guest today is Reverend Richard Joyner. Reverend Joyner is the founder of the Kanita Family Life Center, was named one of CNN's top 10 heroes of the year in 2015, and serves as a chaplain at Nash Healthcare System in Rocky Mount. Yes. Welcome, Richard. Thanks. Thanks, Al, for having me here. Well, it's a real treat to be able to talk to you in light of what I've heard about you and from you already. If we could, Richard, start us off by telling us where you came from. I am originally from Pitt County, and uh, I am uh, presently now uh, Itchcombe County native and uh, work at Nass General and pastor over in Canada. Tell us about your growing up in Pitt County. Well, I grew up in a wonderful family in Pitt County. I'm one of 13 children, uh, seven child and one of nine boys and four girls. Big family. Big family. And uh, we had a very unique period in my family. We grew up as sharecroppers. Uh, my mother and father were wonderful providers, but um, sharecropping had some real not so good experiences as well as some good ones. And so, but one of the experiences I had was that I wanted no dealing with the land. By by the way, by sharecropping, you mean uh, the family didn't own the land, mm-hmm. but you were able to provide for yourself? Uh, we, yes, we did not own the land. And what would happen is that the sharecropper did all of the work up into harvest and into the markets. Once it hit the markets, then that's when the sharecropper stopped cropping and stopped benefiting. Gotcha. Tell us uh, something about your experience as a sharecropping son and, and farmer. What did you do? What, w- well, what was on the farm? Oh, we, guys, my father grew most in the eastern part of North Carolina, tobacco, and then the regular basic crops, corn, soybeans, sweet potatoes, lots of uh, cotton. Uh, and then we had big gardens. We raised our own livestock, pigs, cows, chickens, you know, goats at some point in time. We provided our own food supply. And so um, it was a self-sustainable move where my father didn't make money. He could feed his family, keep a roof on our heads, and keep us warm. You told me before we came into the studio that uh, your father had a saying about oh, farming. Yes. What, yeah. what was that? My father always said that the land would never rob you. People will. Land will respond to you if you're honest and upright and do right by the soil. The soil would multiply what you put in it, so the soil would not cheat you. How long were you on the farm? I was on the farm for 17 years. I lived on the farm, and I can tell you uh, when you can start walking and reaching for a milk bottle, you can start picking up leaves around the Mm -hmm. tobacco Mm barn, and you can start handing tobacco. From there, you end up in the field priming. What happened after those 17 years, where'd you go? What'd you do? I, after those 17 years, my 18th year, I, I enlisted in the military. I felt like uh, I wanted to take the fastest train out. It was my first journey away from home. I had never left North Carolina at that time. You've identified a song for us that I gather has some relevance to your own personal background. Tell us about it. Sam Cooke? Yes, a uh, change will come. The song talks about being born in this little old place and really never thinking you arrive to be anything or get anywhere. Talks about the struggles, struggles of childhood being the goodness of childhood. You know, growing up, always wondering, will I be able to sustain myself away from this farm? Um, Not really understanding the struggles of my father and what it must meant for him to labor all year long and not have anything for us from the farm to show for it, but make a commitment to raise his family, stick with his wife, and be faithful. And you live that for 17 years, and you wonder when will a change come. And not only change it for me, but how would I change it for my siblings that were behind me? And moreover, how would I change it for my father and mother that because of providing for all of these siblings and um, taking in their own nieces and nephews at times that, you know, wasn't much left. So 
So as I grew up listening to this song by Sam Cooke, uh, and most of my brothers, friends, all of us long for that change. Well, let's hear the song, A Change Is Going To Come, by Sam Cooke. What a great song. A Change is Going to Come by Sam Cooke. This is Grace Notes. If you're just joining us, our guest today is Reverend Richard Joyner. Richard, you said that growing up you were looking, hoping, dreaming of a change. Yes, yes. yes. And no doubt uh, have seen many changes since your years on the farm. I have. I really have. Uh, I've seen my own outlook on the farm has changed. Well, let's talk about that. I neglected to mention, by the way, to our listeners that on top of everything else that I've already mentioned, Reverend Joyner is the pastor of Kanita Missionary yeah. Baptist Church. Yeah. Yes. Experiencing the deaths, experiencing the traumas in our region, and seeing the struggle that it put families and put communities in from all aspects, and feeling very hopeless, preaching every Sunday and preaching funerals and, and wondering what is what would be the answer, what would bring the change. And, and my, my background of farming, I decided one day to pull on the side of the road and pray. I really think I was, it was a hot summer day, and uh, I was just frustrated and felt like I needed an answer. Uh, my mom always told me, said, uh, since you're a preacher, you ought to pray. <laughs> so, moms know how to hit the nail on the head don't the they nail in the head, you know <laughs> like, why don't you pray you're a preacher <laughs> and so i did and i really heard a voice saying open your eyes and look around and 
I did, and I saw nothing but land. My experience with land, my experience with farming, you know, I go like, man, this ain't no time to play around. <laughs> you know, God know my experience with land. I, you know, uh-huh. me going back to a garden, no way. Going <laughs> back to the farm, no way. And you know, I almost pose a question to anybody else that I can talk to. You know, okay, this this farming thing or uh, doing something with land. There's a lot of barriers in between that. A lot of emotions, a lot of suppressed stuff that I ran away from, but I never dealt with it. Did not know the, the impact that it was having on my life because there's a part of my life that I didn't recognize that I had lived in, and that was the farm. And a part of what my father loved was farming. And uh, so uh, here's an opportunity to go back to the land. But I announced it to the church that we were going to do agriculture, agribusiness, summer camp. I really felt like that it wouldn't happen. But, you know, since I felt like I got this premonition from God, I should do something with it, you know. And if it flunked, it wasn't me, it was God, okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) God could handle it. God could handle it, and I would be off the hook. Mm -hmm. Well, it just didn't happen that way. What did happen? You you made this announcement? I made the announcement from the pool pit. We're going to have this free summer camp. We're going to be an agribusiness, agriculture summer camp. Anybody can show up. Well, we had over 70 students to show up. And did they show up? And they didn't leave. 14 years later, they're still, it's still there. So this happened 14 years ago. 14 years ago. And they're still coming and staying. Still coming and staying. Some working on PhDs, masters, graduating from college. Some in the military. Some still in the area. But the biggest piece was for me to realize my anger and my pain of farming, you know, and how much I still dislike at that time going back to the soil. Hmm. And why would the youth be excited to play in this field, chase each other, eat from this field, and show up on the camp every morning saying, can we go to the garden? Can we go back to the garden? And looking at bigger farms, looking at bigger spaces, Never really done them. It's just like, what do they see in this? And I guess the question was not what do they see, it was what I'm not seeing. And I was blinded by 17 years of pain. So the impact on what you got into was as much personal as it was community. Oh, it was intensely personal, but it was making decisions for me that I didn't even know it would, that, that would be made. Well, tell us a little more in terms of uh, the specifics of what exactly you do, what you have done with respect to the community garden and health concepts. It's multi-layer. And one of the things that, that it has done is that it's opened up the freedom of this soil. You know, uh, it's a healing place first. The first it healed me, it healed me of those 17 years and reconnected me to my father's love. And the truth that he told, if you treat the soil right, it will not rob you. And it hasn't robbed me these years. It's been very good to me. So we, we run an agriculture, agribusiness summer camp, which is the math, reading, science, technology that our students do from a agriculture piece of learning the genetics of plants, learning about their own genetics, learning how to prepare food that will strengthen them and, and help fight back disease, also learning how to plan to crop pollination through their bees, uh, learning how to do their own backpack buddies that they take home every weekend to prepare a meal that the family would sit down and eat together. Now, I think about it when, as families, when's the last time you and the family actually sit down and had a meal around the table, which is some of the most intimate times I can remember about my family was the time that we sit down around the table that my father made, because you couldn't buy a table for them many people. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he made it. But those are the most intimate times that we had around food that we had grown or chicken or cows that my mom had prepared. Really special times that were unscripted and relaxed. Yes. And conversation went in all sorts of directions. You learn a lot that you way. You learn a lot. And now that we've gotten away from those social development times and to see the garden bring families back to the table. It reminds me of another song that you mentioned to us, Soul Man. Tell us about that. 
We're, we're, I think we're talking about people's souls here. Yeah, right? and, and your yeah. soul also. Yeah, by Brother Columbus. This is one of his favorite songs. He uh, had a red T bird, and you know, back in the days, all the guys would get around and. This thing of being a soul man, you know. It was an exciting song, but it was an intimate song. It was time that we the guys got together. Didn't have anywhere to go, but in our minds, we were in a lot of places. <laughs> and when I think of this song, you know, we are soul people. Well, let's hear it. Soul Man yes. by Sam and Dave. Yes, indeed. That's I'm a Soul Man by Sam and Dave. Our guest today is Reverend Richard Joyner. Richard, uh, tell us about what you're involved with at the Family Life Center. Yes, um, it brings back the value of family and, and almost something that I saw that were really the struggles and, and a lot of poverty that our community were losing focus on family. Uh, one of our family pride was raising children, you know, growing up. You know, mothers and fathers, our parents took real pride in watching us play and watching us grow up and, and really talked about what they saw each of us being able to do. You know, we were kind of losing that. And through this whole process with the gardens and with food and to watch youth be excited again, to watch family be excited about youth participating and helping the family have stable out. Before we came into the studio, uh, you used a term that got my attention, uh, community restructuring, you said. Yes. That really amounts to human development yes. at the same time. Yes. Sustainable human development by community. And that's one of the things that we thrive upon, that this is about the Kanita community as well as other communities um, being sustainable and, uh, and managing their human development, which means that one day I won't be there, but the sustainability of this community will outlive me. How long does your program stay involved in the life of any particular individual? Our students start in our program at four years old. Hmm. Uh, we literally stay involved, and we normally use a phrase until they become a good taxpayer. <laughs> 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 but it's, they become a very sustainable person. 
My father would put it like this. Uh, he would say, you're sustainable when your mom and I come and eat at your table <laughs> and we don't pay for nothing and we don't wash the dishes and we go home. <laughs> then I know that you are sustainable. That's our goal for our students, mm -hmm. that we want them to be able to manage a healthy lifestyle. And uh, one of the, the scriptures that we read is Genesis 12. And when God says to, to Abram at that time, I literally want to make your family a blessing to all families. And that's how I work to our youth. We want you to go and be a blessing to every family in this world. It strikes me that what you've developed, what you've created here, what you've established is really quite unique and runs counter to a lot of the efforts that others put into, call it community restructuring or sort of social enterprise. Have you run into resistance of any kind in terms of your approach? Yes. Our goal is that I don't want to manage a person home. I want to be a support for people. Sometimes institutions don't always know how to empower people mm. without taking them over. And sometimes I don't know how to empower communities without taking communities over. And so we want to model the how do you empower, how do you support, because I don't know anyone that do not want their children or their community to be healthy, to be safe, and to be productive. Anyone that given an opportunity to participate and that type of process will welcome it and make the necessary sacrifices to do it. And so that's our goal. And that's not always easy because it wasn't easy for me going back to the farm. It wasn't easy for me to deal with the anger and the pain that I suppressed for, for where I was, I was going into my 60s, you know, when I started doing this. I guess you practice what you preach in terms of healthy living and yes. so on. Yes. Well, you, at some point, I know, Richard, went to Shaw University Divinity yes. School, is that yes. right? And uh, was that a prelude to your pastoring That work? was, yes, prelude to my pastoring. I uh, always wanted to be a spiritual person that will, would be able to, to have relationships and impact lives in a healthy way. You cited Genesis 12 uh, a few minutes ago. I'm, I'm reminded in light of what you've gotten involved in what you do of, of the scripture that says faith without works is dead. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you're all about faith combined with works. Yes, you're exactly right. Uh, that substance of things hoped for and, mm -hmm. and, and it's, there's evidence that it's not seen and how do you stick with it to bring it to, allow it to come to the reality. It's what I've witnessed with being in Canada. If someone had told me that when I went to Canada that CNN is going to come here and see you, I would have said, okay, what are we going to do to get that done? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, what, what crime would we commit, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, to bring CNN to us? I'm appreciative that they came because of some good that was being done. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it strikes me that the ripple effects of what you've gotten going here are significant, substantial, and they continue. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Well, I can tell you that park side the road that day, listening to my mom and my father say, exercise your faith and pray. Mm -hmm. And just believe what God tell you and do it. You know, do it and just don't let your anger and don't let all your stuff in your past stop you. Just be obedient and do it. But the joy that the youth get and taking boxes to people home, especially, you know, uh, in the fall of the year, we grow this called uh, henpeck salad, and the mm -hmm. elderly people in the region love that salad, <laughs> and, you know, and to see a, a guy, a little boy that maybe had a little problem in school that may be on suspension, take a food box to a senior house, and they just kiss him all over the head and <laughs> hug him, and, and speak so much goodness into them. That, that, and they, that encourages that little boy to do it oh, again. Yeah. Huh? They come out and go like, I'm not so bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's so empowering. I think everybody need a garden. Mm. I think that there's some intimate times of food and, and, and gardening that. Just try it. Do you have a website? Yes. If you Google Kanita Family Life Center. And Kanita is spelled C O N E T O E, not Conto. <laughs> <laughs> not Conto. C O N E T O E, Kanita. Yeah. 
Kanita. Kanita Family Life Center. Dot com. Well, Richard, you talk about people in hopelessness. It seems to me that this that you've gotten going here and have been faithful at for many years now is a source of real hope to many people, and I commend you for it. It's inspiring just to hear you talk about it. How about if we close with another song that you've identified? It seems to me it ties in well to the faith and works principle yes. that we were yeah. just discussing. Take Me to the King by Tamala Mann. Tell yeah. us about it. Well, it really sums up the essence that this is not Richard's idea. This is came out of sitting inside the road praying and that God says, if you do this, if you trust me and you step out and step into your pain and step into the field, I'll make it work for you. And it's a God-sized task. And this is what Tamela May says, take me to the king. You know, I get tired, and, but this is the king. This is God. And it has, it has produced God outcomes that I can take no credit for. It's all God. Well, I think you've said all that needs to be said. Uh, Richard, let me, uh, before we hear the song, thank you for being here. It's It's been really special, and as I said, uh, inspiring to have you here and talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank this great radio station for keeping us inspired. Mm -hmm. Let's hear the song, Take Me to the King, by Tamala Mann. Take me to the king I don't have much to bring My heart is torn in pieces It's my offering Take me to the king Truth is I'm tired Options are few I'm trying to pray, but where are you? I'm all churched out, hurt and abused. I can't think what's left to do. Come, on. truth is, I'm no strength to fight, no tears to cry, even if I tried, but still my soul refuses to die, mm -hmm. one touch will change my life, take me to
words to bring my heart's torn to pieces it's my offering You've been listening to Grace Notes, a special program here on Life 103.1 featuring people who may be relatively unknown, but who meet life's challenges in ways that brighten the lives of those around them. Our producer is Christina Dolan. I'm Alan Button, and we invite you to join all of us here at the station again next Friday at 530 for Grace Notes on Life 103.1.